Good morning, Wabash. I want to take about 45 minutes this morning to present a medical perspective of COVID-19. The title of my talk was suggested by Dr. Feller last week during his chapel and is primarily aimed at students, but there's plenty of information to benefit everyone. My medical associate, Dr. Scott Douglas, and I are the Wabash College Physicians. I'm a beta and graduated from Wabash in 1983, and Dr. Douglas is a Lambda Chi and graduated in 1984. We also serve as the public health officers for Montgomery County, where Wabash is located. Before we get started, you may want to include your parents when you watch this, or they can watch the recording when it's posted later online. I'd like to start with some objectives. Uh, the main goal today is to give everyone a uniform knowledge base about COVID-19 and what we're going to do at Wabash to try to keep it at bay. I want to talk a bit about the biology of the virus uh, and the epidemiology. We'll assess uh, risk and how to mitigate that risk, talk a little bit about testing and monitoring and how we're going to manage cases on campus. And of note, there might be an exam at the end, so please pay attention. I'm sure you've all had fun living with your parents since March. Getting out of their house and staying out of there is the goal we're all shooting for. You may recognize this quote from a couple of weeks ago. Dr. Feller uh, was quite true. As he indicated, uh, the only constant with COVID-19 is change. I therefore had to update this talk probably 10 times in the last two weeks. You'll notice that COVID-19 guidance changes with time. I know that can be very confusing, but it's just how science works. We're constantly adjusting our advice based on the best understanding of the science at the time. I am optimistic with all the good work of the Healthy Campus Task Force and other groups on campus and with the cooperation of students, faculty, staff, uh, that we can keep you guys on campus and deliver a top flight education this fall. You've likely seen many cartoons like this in the last few weeks. Uh, we do have to lay the politics aside, however, and focus on the facts. This is a concept I want to go over briefly. Um, it's a psychological uh, term that's, that some of you may recognize, and it can explain a lot of the behaviors we see associated with COVID-19. Cognitive dissonance occurs when a person holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values, or participates in an action that goes against one of these three. Um, the, the person experiences some psychological stress as a result of that, and they'll often uh, do all in his or her power to change the beliefs until they appear to become consistent. So dissonance theory, which includes this, explains why changing others' political opinions is so hard, if not impossible, um, especially if they've thrown a lot of time, money, effort, and their votes at them. So this quote out of The Atlantic uh, a couple of weeks ago um, specifically um, talks about how cognitive dissonance occurs with COVID-19. So the cognition or thought that you want to go back to school or to a party or go to a bar with your friends, that's dissonant with any info we might uh, give you um, that would tell you those actions might be dangerous, if not to yourself or to others uh, that you interact with. So it's a big concern because COVID-19 really is an existential threat to the Wabash community. Um, it's time for some straight talk as Dr. Feller uh, wanted me to title this presentation. So you may have seen this uh, from a few weeks ago. Penn State had its first death from uh, COVID in a young person. So we all feel immortal when we're young, when we're in college. Um, it's very common, and we have a term for it. It's called magical thinking. Um, so our goal today is uh, to give you all some education to hopefully uh, combat that um, so we can uh, do well with the virus this year. Do a little more humor. This is a take on uh, JFK's famous moon speech. However, you're not going for cookies. Uh, you're going for the best college education in the country. So to do this, we're all students, faculty, staff, alumni going to have to do what is hard to get through this together. 
This is a marketing tagline from a few years back at Wabash. You know, Wabash, we even had the period back then. It won't be easy. It will be worth it. Um, so we have to use our motto, Wabash always fights. We, you know, we're definitely going to have to endure some short-term pain this semester for long-term gain to uh, keep the college open long-term. You know, we really need to protect uh, our Wabash family members who are older, and especially those, both uh, faculty, staff, and students who have high-risk medical conditions that, that put them at increased risk if they got sick with uh, COVID. And you also have classmates who simply can't complete their education, uh, their Wabash education, if they aren't present on campus. They may not have uh, reliable internet. They may have to work, care for their family, et cetera. So they really need to be here. Uh, to participate. You know, this was a sad uh, site last spring when the campus had to shut down. You definitely want to uh, avoid that again. So our goals seem pretty simple, but it will take a lot of work by all of us to achieve them. So we want to keep the college open to get the best education possible and keep everyone healthy, including uh, you guys, faculty, staff, visitors, etc. So I want to go over the uh, biology a little bit of the virus next. Um, it's SARS-CoV-2 is the actual name of the virus. So it's one of seven coronaviruses that are known to infect humans. All those came from animals. Um, it's a novel coronavirus, novel meaning new, that made the jump from animals, uh, probably bats, to humans. So our immune systems really haven't seen it before. Um, there's been three of these uh, novel coronaviruses in the last 18 years. The first was Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. Uh, they've renamed that SARS-CoV. Um, and then the second that came about in uh, about 10 years later, 2012, was MERS, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, that was a coronavirus that came out of camels. Uh, SARS came out of civet cats. And now we're dealing with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And we think that, again, probably came from bats. So these have all uh, been around for a while. SARS and MERS, uh, you know, they've pretty well died out. Um, MERS is very severe. It had a much higher fatality rate than uh, either SARS or um, COVID-19. So where did the COVID-19 get its name? Um, you can see there it's a coronavirus disease 2019. So... Some people think uh, 19 means it's the 19th coronavirus, but it's just the year that emerged um, in humans. So the way it works is uh, the virus um, gets in your body, either through uh, inhalation or touching your mucous membranes, your mouth, your eyes, your nose. And it binds to these uh, ACE2 receptors on your cell surface. Once that happens, uh, the virus cuts open your cell membrane, and then the genetic material from the virus uh, gets inside your cells and uses your own cellular machinery uh, to reproduce itself. So we originally thought uh, COVID-19 was just a respiratory disease. That's how all people were presenting with lung problems. But we found over the past few months studying many people that it really affects all organ systems. We've seen a lot of people of all ages have strokes and heart attacks. Um, a lot of that is due to blood clotting problems uh, that the virus um, instigates um, a lot of uh, organ damage, again, from more blood clots. So it can happen to anyone. And uh, as we study it more and more, we're finding more and more things it does uh, to the body. A lot of the um, damage to the body is done from the inflammatory reaction where your body is uh, trying to fight the virus. And uh, there's a condition, particularly in children, a few weeks after they have their initial infection uh, that is due to inflammatory uh, reactions. You know, study data is beginning to emerge that's very concerning to us, um, even in young COVID patients. Um, with SARS back in 2012, uh, if you look at people long-term on, uh, on that uh, illness, there were primarily a lot of chronic lung problems or fibrosis, which is scarring of the lung tissue. So those folks, uh, many of them had difficulty uh, breathing long-term and are still suffering problems. A big concern we're starting to uh, recognize, um, not only with lung problems, is a condition called myocarditis. Um, this is a major concern, especially in people who have been hospitalized or had severe uh, COVID infection. 
a certain percentage of these patients are having abnormal heart rhythms. And we've even seen some structural changes to the anatomy of their hearts from the infection. So this has the potential to affect uh, athletes in particular. Um, you know, a lot of organizations are recommending now athletes who have had severe infections um, have uh, EKGs and echocardiograms performed to ensure they don't have uh, structural changes in their heart. So we don't yet know if this is going to be an issue in individuals with mild disease, but certainly uh, we're seeing a fair amount of it in people with severe disease. And we've also seen some European and Chinese studies uh, that look at lung function in people and um, quite a few people are exhibiting up to 20 to 30 percent uh, decreases in their lung function. So long-term effects uh, we definitely uh, are concerned about. There's been a Dutch study uh, that was released about a month ago. It was a longitudinal study that looked at about 1,600 patients for about three months after their initial infection. The important thing here is 91 percent of these folks were not hospitalized. They were outpatients. So when they went back and interviewed these folks, they found about 95% of them reported some trouble with uh, one or more simple daily activities. Um, so that's very concerning for us. This is a table uh, that came out of that study, um, the most frequent complaints. So heading the list was fatigue. Um, so that can follow uh, virtually any virus. So we don't know if uh, specific to uh, SARS-CoV-2 or uh, just, just a viral syndrome. But a lot of lung issues, you can see shortness of breath and chest pressure, chronic headaches and muscle pain, um, dizziness and kind of a chronic cough. So all these can be long term effects of the virus uh, that people may have to deal with for months or even years. So I've also uh, heard from some patients that anecdotally that they have what's called brain fog. They just uh, can't think very well. They have difficulty concentrating. And certainly something like that would be a difficult for a college student. I'd like to get into uh, the transmissibility of the virus, how easy it is to spread from person to person. Um, we found that viral shedding, people that can uh, shed the virus to others, it's kind of based on where you are in your illness. Uh, maximum shedding appears uh, between days two and five. And the attack rate in the household varies anywhere from about 5% to 19%. So there's been multiple studies that have looked at that. Um, and that's kind of the range uh, we're seeing right now as far as household members who develop the infection if someone else in the household has it. The key thing here is you are 19 times more likely to uh, catch the virus if you're around someone indoors. So that'll become very important later as uh, I look at some other things. It's certainly uh, easier to spread it if you're coughing, sneezing, singing, yelling. And we're not sure what the viral dose is that's uh, needed to cause infection. You know, if it's a few thousand particles, if it's millions, what? So that's under study as well. We do know it's much more efficient at transmitting human to human than influenza is. So that's a concern as well and why it's spreading so rapidly around the world. I want to look at some case studies next. Um, this, this is a rather a famous one that came out of South Korea early in the year. It's a, a call center on the 11th floor of an office building, and they traced uh, these infections back to one individual. So you can see the top uh, part of the building. Um, all those blue seats are people that uh, were eventually infected by this one person that started it. There's a few in the bottom part of the graphic that were probably uh, folks that may have ridden up in the elevator with people from the other side of the building. This is a case study from Skagit County, Washington. That was a choir practice that happened back in March. So a person showed up to this choir practice infected and eventually gave it to 53 people. Um, about 5.7% of those were hospitalized and they had two people die. So one person coming to one choir, choir practice spread it to all those people and eventually killed two people. This is another example, um, you know, public health officials and the government are certainly not trying to ban religion. We see that a lot in the news um, or people with a complaint about religious freedom, but we're really concerned about spread uh, in churches. We've seen quite a few cases like this. So in this case, so the two, two people came to the uh, church service that had 92 people at it. And uh, just in that one service, they infected 35 of those people and that resulted in three deaths. Those purple, or excuse me, those people that uh, 
The church service also went out to their community and they infected an additional 26 people and uh, one of those died. So out of two people coming to one church service, uh, they had four deaths. So you can see how quickly it spreads in uh, closed communities. I want to briefly talk about athletics. Um, even though Wabash won't be competing in fall sports this year, um, there will still be practices and conditioning. Um, so, you know, we've kind of looked at uh, athletic programs who have been out on the field for a few weeks now, and it appears that most uh, infections in athletes appear to originate from their social contacts, uh, being at parties, being at bars, things like that. And it does not appear to be uh, spreading as much actually in practices and competition. So um, we'll see if that holds true as the uh, seasons progress in schools that are that are having athletic programs. This is kind of the understanding of uh, SARS-CoV transmission at the beginning of the year, that it was spread primarily through large respiratory droplets. You hear about that a lot in the news. So you kind of think of these large droplets as uh, small bowling balls. We'll get into that a little bit more later, but this is the uh, two meter or six foot distance uh, we talk about when someone coughs or sneezes. those large droplets are expelled from their mouth and nose, and most of them fall to the floor in about a six foot distance. So that's that's where we get our six foot of distancing where we're after. And also putting a mask on the person that's coughing and sneezing reduces that uh, droplet transmission quite a bit. So we initially also thought transmission via contaminated surfaces played a large role in transmission of this virus. Uh, but recent studies indicate maybe 6% or so of infections are spread this way. But despite that, we're still going to be do a lot of cleaning and disinfecting on campus. So you'll learn more about that later. This is a letter that was uh, sent to clinical infectious diseases earlier in July. It was signed by 239 uh, respiratory scientists who study airborne transmission of disease. You know, they were very concerned that the virus is likely transmitted through smaller airborne droplets. So not the bowling balls with the large droplets, but Think of these more as BB sized um, comparatively as opposed to the bowling balls. So there's some cases that are, are, are fairly well known that uh, support this uh, aerosolized transmission of the virus. This is one uh, out of a restaurant in Guangzhou, China, uh, late in January of this year. Um, if you look at uh, table A in the upper middle, you'll see patient A1, um, the yellow circle with the red outline. This person came to this uh, dinner party that lasted a few hours, and all the other people that have uh, red circles around them eventually uh, contracted the illness from that person. So what's important here is the uh, air conditioning unit at the top right that has the arrows. Um, that, that arrow was blowing across these three tables, and they think that mixture of the air blowing around those three tables was responsible uh, for that type of transmission. You can see the three tables at the bottom. Um, no one got ill uh, on those in those tables. So this is kind of a graphic of what that uh, air conditioning looks like. So the green tables at the bottom are okay. The three at the top um, had spread primarily through that uh, air conditioning blowing across there. This is an illustration of the importance of ventilation. Uh, this guy on the left has uh, the virus. He's coughing and sneezing, uh, spreading these droplets in the air. And the uh, woman on the right uh, potentially is gonna inhale some of those and get infected. So this is a poorly ventilated room. If you look at the top, you've got airs coming in and out. So not much ventilation, the windows closed versus what we like to see, um, window open if possible, and uh, maximizing the amount of uh, ventilation and airflow through the room to uh, dilute those particles and get them out of the room, versus the Chinese restaurant where that was all closed off. We want this type of situation where the virus can leave. So Campus Services uh, over the summer has examined all the ventilation systems on campus and they've uh, maximized the amount of outside air coming into those. And you may see some uh, classes being held outside even and some windows being open as well, depending on the building. So I wanna briefly look at uh, what infected individuals look like. Uh, you've seen this perhaps on the news, about 35% of these folks don't have any symptoms. These are the ones that uh, concern us, that they're running around and 
spreading the virus uh, without their knowledge. So we term them asymptomatic people. We found that viral shedding can occur a couple of days before uh, someone develops symptoms, those that do develop symptoms. So when we contact trace a positive case, we always uh, go back a couple of days before the patient develops symptoms and identify the people they were around so we can uh, get them looked at as well. The incubation time from being exposed to the uh, virus to actually developing symptoms is a little over five days. This is an important fact that uh, for every COVID case currently, we're identi we are identifying uh, based on our current testing availability, that we're estimating there's seven to 10 people out there that are infected that we're not finding. Infection fatality rate is an epidemiologic term. Uh, it's basically the uh, ratio of the number of people that die from the infection over the total number of cases. So it's very difficult to know the total number of cases in the U.S., um, especially with the asymptomatic people. But we found the infection fatality rate for this virus is likely between one half and one percent. So that's about five to ten times uh, what influenza kills every year. So if we let the virus run wild, that would uh, potentially kill about two million people in the United States and 47 million worldwide. It's important to remember that this is in the modern era when we've got uh, good medical care versus 100 years ago with the Spanish flu that uh, many more people died, but they really did not uh, have good medical uh, care at that point. Amazingly, a, a recent study of, of college students in Health Education and Behavior Journal um, were only able to identify the top symptoms of COVID about 18% of the time. So these are the most common uh, 10 symptoms we see, the top three in the middle with the red stars. Uh, those, those are uh, most commonly associated with uh, an infection. And if you have all three of those together, it's pretty certain you've got uh, COVID, especially this time of year when there's not a lot of other respiratory viruses running around. Go into some epidemiology briefly. Um, on this uh, graphic, don't really pay attention to the arrows at the top, but basically this is showing the magnitude difference between a typical seasonal influenza season, a very severe uh, influenza season in the middle, and then COVID-19 on the right. So overwhelming our hospitals is the uh, main concern we've had, which you've heard, I'm sure. That's starting to happen now in Arizona, Texas, and California, especially in rural areas. They don't have any beds, and some people are having to be transferred hundreds of miles to other hospitals. Also, we're very concerned about the combined effect of COVID and influenza this fall and winter, um, having both of those circulating at the same time. So that's why we're requiring influenza vaccine for the Wabash community this year. This is known as the COVID-19 case iceberg. Uh, at the pyramid on the left, you've got uh, death at the top, the red person, and then all the people that are infected below that person. So. For every single death we see, there's about 125 infections total, and about 81 of those are symptomatic and about 44 asymptomatic. So that asymptomatic uh, rate is about 35%. Um, so you can see there's a lot of people out there that are infected that uh, we're currently not identifying. This is Indiana data as of July 18th. Um, kind of the positive case rate and the age distribution. If you look at these graphs over time, you would see that the positivity rate is increasing in Indiana. We'll see that in a sec here, but the concerning thing for us, uh, like it is nationwide, is the younger age groups are now starting to get more and more infections and spreading uh, it to other older age groups as well. So that's a concern for college students, certainly. This is a graph of the uh, Indiana daily positive test rate. So recently it had been running around uh, 6 to 8%, but this has been rising. Um, the key thing to remember here is, is a rising test positivity rate is often followed uh, two to four weeks later by an increased hospitalization rate and also an increased death rate. Um, so these are the metrics that led uh, Governor Holcomb in Indiana to institute a statewide uh, mask mandate uh, yesterday. Um, our case numbers in Montgomery County, where Wabash is, are remaining low, but we expect them to rise as uh, schools reopen, including Wabash. There's different ways we can assess our risk of uh, developing COVID. 
Um, this is a, a map that's updated daily from the Harvard, Harvard Global Health Institute. Um, so this kind of gives a uh, colored representation of the U.S. Red areas are uh, areas of high incidence of the virus and the green areas are the lowest. So you can see that the uh, southeastern U.S., South Carolina, Florida, Texas, and then uh, Los Angeles as well, Arizona uh, to the west are high areas of uh, COVID incidence right now. Um, you've no doubt heard young people rarely have severe complications of COVID-19, which is true. However, uh, we all have an ethical responsibility at Wabash to protect others around us, including your professors and all the others that provide your uh, Wabash education, your classmates who may have uh, issues that put them at higher risk. So this is an uh, age distribution of the Wabash faculty and staff. You can see we've got quite a few people who are in uh, the older age, higher risk groups. So these are the folks we really need to protect. You may not know the uh, risk groups to have severe disease, but this is a summary of those, you know, older ages, certainly. We worry particularly about people with hypertension and obesity, as well as uh, cardiovascular disease in Indiana in particular. Those are the top groups that uh, really have severe disease. Chronic lung disease, including uh, emphysema, asthma, things like that. Um, neurologic diseases like multiple sclerosis. Um, so we really have a large representation of many of these uh, diseases on campus and faculty, staff, and students as well. So that's why we really need to uh, protect these folks. So I want to go in briefly into how you can avoid things uh, that could potentially kill you. Um, you know, COVID-19 is analogous to other dangers we face in our lives. I kind of want to use radiation exposure as an example. So what we want to do around radiation is spend the least amount of time around it. So uh, get away from uh, get away from it. Distance is very important. Uh, the physics jocks in the audience know that, uh, you know, when you when you double the distance from radiation, uh, you get about one quarter the the amount of dose. Um, so you want to distance, distance, distance uh, from radiation as well as this virus. And shielding is important uh, from radiation. Typically, we use lead, but you know, thick concrete walls, things you might see in a nuclear reactor. Um, shielding is important. And we can uh, make the analogy to uh, using masks with COVID. So this is very important. Um, you want to learn to calculate your risk constantly um, in the COVID era we're all living in. So you need to do this all the time, not only your own risk, but also uh, what your risk might be to others. And you've really got to take this into account when you plan activities on campus, away from campus, anywhere you go, basically. So you want to review your three C's. You want to get this down in your head. Um, something like this might show up on an exam. So we want to know, uh, we want to think, are we going to be in a confined space? Um, so that's extremely important because we know uh, if you're in a confined space, you're much more likely to catch the virus. That 19 times uh, in, times increased risk, especially indoors. Is there going to be crowding in uh, the place you're going to be? And you're going to have close contact with others. So this is how COVID-19 is analogous to radiation exposure. You want to reduce your time of contact with others. You want to avoid crowded, confined spaces. So that would be the same as distancing from radiation. And you want to have your mask on um, when you can't socially distance, or actually we're, we recommend even uh, to just be in the habit of keeping it on all the time if possible. So I'm going to go into some uh, risk activity groups. Um, you know, what your risk is in doing various things. Low risk activities, uh, you would expect staying at home alone or with just a few members of your household would be the lowest risk. Walking, running, biking outdoors, or having picnics or porch dining, picking up takeout or groceries, those are all low-risk activities. You'll see the common theme there. I've underlined outdoors three times. So again, 19 times less likely to get it if you're outdoors versus indoors. Some low to medium-risk activities would be, uh, you know, do an ultimate on the mall or whatever, distance sports, um, groceries and retail shopping, uh, typically okay. Medium risk, getting a little uh, little worse here. If you go to your doctor, dentist, uh, hospital, um, a little bit increased risk. And I will say 
Many people are avoiding going to the hospital for uh, acute conditions like heart attacks is the biggest example we can think of. But um, you should not avoid going to a hospital for emergency um, for fear of catching COVID. Most hospitals are very on top of things as far as reducing your risk. So dining outdoors at a restaurant, uh, Ubering or taxiing, going to a museum, that's uh, fairly low risk because those tend not to be crowded. Medium to high risk activities, uh, working out in a gym, um, not only for the uh, you know aerosolized, aerosolized virus that may be around, um, but also for the contact precautions. So constant cleaning in those areas. Barber shops, uh, medium to high risk, although I've got a case study coming up in a bit that's very interesting. Um, indoor restaurants, uh, try to avoid those at this point. And working in an office or other area where there might be more people around. High risk uh, activities. Uh, this photo is could be a typical uh, Wabash uh, party. You got a few friends together playing video games or whatnot. Uh, the concern here is we're sitting close together. We don't have masks on and we've got uh, some alcoholic beverages there. Um, so alcohol and indoor parties are our biggest worry, um, not only at Wabash, but uh, elsewhere, every college, every university. Um, just bars where uh, your average Joe go to. So alcohol lowers your inhibitions, as you know, and you don't pay attention to calculating and reducing your risky behaviors. So I already talked about you need to constantly be assessing your risk and you can't do that if you've got uh, alcohol on board. So living unit parties are our biggest concern uh, for introducing the virus to the Wabash community. So that's not just having parties at Wabash, but also going off campus uh, to parties at other universities, uh, going to bars elsewhere, et cetera. So a concern we have here is if we've got folks that go to a party, say at Purdue, somebody brings the virus back and they start to infect everybody in their living unit, um, that could be a big problem. So it could be if we see significant spread in a particular living unit, a fraternity, a dorm, whatever, that may uh, force us to close that uh, living unit um, for you know like 14 days, uh, send everybody home, or keep them on campus if they can't go home until we get that living unit uh, healthy again. So contact sports, uh, big risk. That's why we've uh, currently shut down our program. The NCAC has. Um, you know, we can make light of uh, the cactus, uh, but this is ground zero, the biggest uh, risk we have for shutting down Wabash. So I've got a picture on the lower right also of uh, Chapel Singh. That happens to be my pledge class back in uh, 1979. That handsome guy is me. This is a letter to uh, UC Berkeley students not long ago. Um, so their main concern is they had 47 cases in a week, and they traced all those back to the uh, Cal Greek system. So parties on campus uh, um, cause some major issues. We do not want that at Wabash. Some activities that occur at Wabash specifically, you know, Chapel Sing, um, as you'd expect, would be a big uh, risk for spread with all the yelling and screaming. Um, I'm concerned about pledge ship activities. You know, in the past, there's been some issues with sleep deprivation um, that increases your risk for developing any virus or fighting a virus off. So, so that, along with uh, living close together, things like that. So we've got to be very careful about that. Sphinx Club, Ryan Ship, et cetera. I'm sure you can think of other high-risk activities that are specific to Wabash. So again, you've got to constantly be doing your risk assessments. So I agree with Dr. Feller that much uh, of what we're recommending to prevent the spread of COVID on campus flies in the face of our normal Wabash culture. So you're gonna get fatigued pretty quickly with the recommendations and requirements on campus. But again, we're going to have to have some uh, short-term pain for that long-term gain. Tyler Wade had a nice tweet uh, a few days ago that, that some uh, institutions of higher education have much more uh, or many more problems than we do. Um, so be pray for those people. Um, some campus-wide measures, uh, you know, this is not specific to Wabash, but certainly focusing on the triangle on the right. Um, the things at the bottom of the triangle have the least effect at uh, mitigating 
COVID spread and the ones on the top have the most effect. So if you look at personal protective equipment, masks, gowns, goggles, things like that, um, they work, but they don't work without uh, using some other things in conjunction. So administrative changes are a little more effective, uh, altering class sizes, altering uh, scheduling so people aren't uh, walking back and forth past each other, et cetera. And then physical distancing is even more important. So this is key. Even if we're all wearing masks on campus, we have to maintain our physical distance as much as possible. Just like back to the radiation, time shielding distance. So we have to use all these uh, mitigation majors together to uh, keep us all safe. And at the top, search, certainly uh, virtual learning or high flex situations, things like that will uh, keep people spaced out even more. So you'll see a combination of these on campus this year. Don't be these guys. Uh, we're all going to wear masks, but you don't want to be these guys. Um, the most common ones I see are the schnoz, the chin strap, and the plague talker. So uh, take a quick look at these, but you want to wear your mask uh, correctly. So everybody will be issued two masks this year. Um, you know, the more and more data we see, the more and more communities the institute um, universal mask wearing, the more and more reduction we see um, in spread of the virus. So they do work. Um, that's why we're going to use them. That's why the state of Indiana is instituting them now. Um, and you really need to concentrate on using them properly and caring for them properly. Uh, we'll talk about in a bit here. This is a study from Health Education and Behavior uh, that revealed a couple of in interesting student beliefs about COVID-19. Um, you know, students had high confidence they could protect themselves from the virus, a 3.69 out of 5. And they did not believe that wearing a mask was a significant tool in prevention. They only gave it a 1.87 out of 5. So perhaps that's due to changing CDC guidance. You know, early on they didn't recommend mask use. Now they do. Um, but it can definitely improve your uh, chances of not catching the virus. This is a nice graphic out of uh, University of Iowa. Guy on the left has the virus, guy on the right doesn't. So starting at the top, very high risk if nobody's wearing masks. If the uh, uninfected person wears a mask, reduces your risk a little bit. If the source of the infection wears the mask, we call that source control. Um, that reduces the risk even more. If both are wearing masks, even better. If you add distance to that, that's six feet, you know, your risk goes way down. And certainly if you're uh, both at home alone, you know, you're going to have about zero risk. So that just reinforces the fact everybody needs to wear a mask and you need to uh, maintain that six foot distancing as much as possible. And it's a busy graph, but I want you to concentrate uh, on the upper right, the red and pink lines. This is uh, Italy and New York City. And uh, you can see the trajectory of the solid line uh, after they instituted mask use. So those two circles is when each place instituted mask use. So the dotted line is where the infection uh, growth would have occurred. And they bent that curve when they instituted the mask. So that is even more evidence that shows uh, universal masking can have a, an effect on virus transmission. This is the study on the hairdressers I promised. Um, they looked at these folks. We had two hairdressers that came to work, both infected with the virus, but they were wearing masks and they had 139 clients. All were masked. So everybody got their hair done, looked beautiful, and they have not traced any cases of spread um, from those two infected people. So yet more evidence uh, that masks are effective and why we recommend them. You know, there's a right way and a wrong way to use a mask, as I said. Um, I'd encourage everybody to view this five-minute video from uh, Dr. Diamond that's on YouTube. We've got a link to it in the FAQs, uh, the one that's titled, When Should I Wear a Face Covering or Mask? So that's at wabash.edu slash COVID. This is an interesting uh, study that just came out. Um, you know, wearing a mask appears to give others around you social cues to keep their distance from you. So if they see you uh, walking around with a mask on, or in this study, uh, we're wearing goggles, um, subjectively or whatever, they're going to say, whoa, that person might be infected and they're going to steer clear of you. So when everyone wears their masks, everybody tends to be uh, more spread apart as well. So in addition to three C's, we've got three W's. I want you uh, to uh, put in your memories since that, that might appear on a test as well. We want you to wear your mask as we talked about at infinitum. You want to wash your hands. 
and you want to watch your distance. So masking, distancing, we've talked about and talked about. Hand washing and hand sanitizer, you've heard a billion times as well. Um, you definitely, uh, most people don't know you should really do that before and after you uh, monkey with your face covering. So if you're going to put a mask on, wash your hands and put your mask on, then you should uh, um, wash it after you remove your mask as well. Or if you touch your face, um, you should use a hand sanitizer or wash your hands. Of course, after you sneeze, blow your nose or cough, uh, before you eat, using the toilet, etc. And if you care for anybody that's sick, you ought to do it as well. So the good news is a study recently showed that about 80% of college students are at least aware that a 20 second hand wash uh, can reduce your chances of infection. And that goes for influenza and everything else as well. Briefly, I'll talk about monitoring and testing. You know, Wabash is hiring students this year to be uh, what's called care team leaders and managers. So um, Eric Lacoma came up with this name, uh, the care team, COVID action response and education. We really like that. We feel it's going to have a significant uh, potential to keep our infection rate low. So you'll be learning more about this uh, after you guys move in and uh, these guys get trained up and ready to go. So each one of these care team leaders is going to be responsible for about 20 students. They'll kind of monitor their health, their mental health, physical health, answer any questions, etc. So the coordinators for this program are uh, Joe Rogers and Coach Olmstead. Um, they are really fired up to get this going. Um, so we'll teach these folks uh, some public health um, procedures as well as how to uh, manage your health, both mental and physical. So they'll be your primary point of contact for questions, concerns. They can bump it up the chain if they can't answer, uh, answer your questions, et cetera. You know, the earlier we can catch infections, the more likely uh, the college is going to be to remain open. So this will not work if everyone doesn't use uh, this app that we've developed and record honest answers. So our IT department has worked with us all summer to develop this symptom monitoring app. Um, it was based on one used uh, in Boston at Mass General Brigham Hospital. Once they started using that, they markedly reduced the spread of COVID among their uh, healthcare workers. So each day you're gonna be, uh, this is student, staff, faculty, um, each day you'll be required to enter your temperature and indicate uh, any symptoms you might be experiencing. So if it uh, crosses a certain threshold, that's going to send an alert to the Student Health Center staff, and either one of us or a member of the Student Life staff will contact students who have a positive screen, and uh, we'll work on next steps. So remember what Dr. Feller said last week. If you are ill, if you're sick, we want you to stay in your living unit. Do not come out until you've received uh, some advice from student health or uh, um, student life staff. So don't come to work sick. Don't come to class sick. A lot of people ask about testing. That's probably the biggest question we get. You know, there's many types of tests that can detect COVID infection. Each type has pros and cons and has to be administered judiciously based on our suspicion of illness and also the general prevalence of COVID-19 uh, on campus and the local Montgomery County community, Indiana, et cetera. So it's a moving target as far as uh, how we test and who we test. You know, we're currently finalizing our plans on testing students. You'll be hearing more about that from uh, Center Hall. The key thing to remember with any test is it's a snapshot. It's not a magic bullet that, okay, my test is, is negative. I'm good to do whatever I want. You still have to mask. You still have to distance because um, you may be negative today and positive tomorrow. So despite that negative test, uh, if we have a high index of suspicion, you may have the infection. You're, you're pretty symptomatic, but you still have a negative test. Not, not every person has a positive test who's sick. Um, if we have that high likelihood uh, suspicion, we still may quarantine or isolate you. On campus, we'll be doing uh, real-time PCR testing. This uh, looks for the genetic material of virus. Um, it's, it's an anterior nose collection, so it's not as uncomfortable as uh, some of the nasopharyngeal swabs you may have seen. Um, so we're going to test symptomatic students for sure and their close contacts. So if we got a symptomatic student, we're going to isolate them. Who were you in contact with the last few days and two days prior to developing those symptoms or your positive test? And we're going to uh, likely test those folks too. You know, we may test more broadly. We may test an entire uh, 
a you know, suite of uh, guys living together. We might do a whole floor. We might do a whole dorm, a whole fraternity. A lot will depend on circumstances. So antibody tests, uh, it's important. There's a lot of those out there that sh potentially show if you've had a previous infection. So it's important to remember these do not guarantee immunity. So there's a lot of false positives with antibody tests. Says you've had the virus, says you're immune, but actually you haven't or not immune. We just simply do not know at this time how uh, long your immunity is. Um, so we won't be using antibody testing. So how are we going to manage ca uh, cases on campus? We will uh, do it the typical uh, public health 101 way. Uh, starting at the upper left, we're going to test people. Um, if they're infected, we will isolate them, either in their living unit or we have a place on campus to put folks. We're going to find uh, who you've been exposed to and test them, and we'll quarantine those folks. So we want to box in this infection so it doesn't spread out further in campus. Now, this does not apply with community spread. Community spread means we cannot figure out who was exposed to whom. So uh, when, when we get to that point, um, this type of testing is basically worthless. The virus is just running rampant at that point. So what we'll do if you're infected is uh, isolate you. So Dr. Feller has mentioned before, we have uh, concerns about isolating people because it is a form of torture, locking somebody up uh, for 10 days. The good news is if there's other people that are infected, they'll be uh, in the same facility together. Um, so we don't take this very lightly. Um, so we've, we'll either put you there and perhaps send you home if you're nearby. Uh, we'll get you meals. We'll get you some instructions how to care for yourself and check on you. Your care team leader will be checking on you. Um, student life or student health will be checking on you. You'll have a quarantine kit. All the information on that's in the FAQs. You know, if we quarantine people, you're in exposure. We're waiting on your test or whatever. Uh, it's a little more flexible. You know, again, we'll probably send folks home if we can. Might quarantine you to your living unit. Or uh, if we get a lot of uh, patients, we may have to uh, use an off-campus site as well. So you'll get fed, you'll get your instructions in your uh, quarantine kit as well. Uh, student health center operations are going to be a little uh, bit different this year. Um, we want all requests for appointments to go through Nurse Amadon. We don't want any walk-ins. We don't pe want people coming over to the Allen Center that potentially might be infected and spreading it in a high-density uh, building like that. So you can email her, call her. Um, she will schedule you an appointment. We're going to have a, a variety of ways to see you guys who are well. We may see some guys in person that we have to. We may be doing some virtual visits as well, like we did uh, when you guys went home this spring. Sick visits are going to be seen outside the Allen Center. We're in the process of putting a facility together to do that away from everybody and uh, with some outdoor facilities as well to limit everybody's exposure risk. So the hours may vary. We may even have uh, some afternoon, evening hours. Uh, we'll have to play that uh, by ear as we go. So if you haven't already done so, you need to update your Magnus Health account today. Um, again, students won't be permitted on campus without a completed up-to-date account. It's important to, act, to scroll down to the bottom of every screen to make sure you get every uh, question answered um, so we can get you cleared up. In order to be on campus this year, you all agree to abide by the Gentleman's Compact. I encourage you to go back and read that to, to understand what our expectations are. So in summary, uh, you know, Wabash, you guys really need to stand taller. Um, you know, we've always distinguished ourselves from other students at other colleges and universities, and this definitely needs to uh, continue in spades this year. You need to think critically. Follow the scientific evidence, not the politics. You need to act responsibly. You remember those three C's and the three W's that you need to practice. You want to lead effectively, work with your care team leaders, um, show everybody uh, you can minimize uh, your risk uh, to yourself and your risk to others. And you most definitely want to live humanely, probably most importantly. And you know, we've got a lot of people who could potentially get very sick if they were infected. So you want to show care and concern for them. Um, and other people you might come, come into contact with. So again, this is our, where we want you to get your information this year, um, wabash.edu slash COVID. We've got everything uh, updating there frequently. If you've got any questions uh, that aren't answered there that you, you, you want answered, uh, send your questions to COVID at wabash.edu. And remember, we're Wabash together. 
I hope this uh, talk was informative. Um, I hope you have a safe and uh, productive year. Really sorry athletics aren't going to be uh, happening this fall, but we will get through this and come out better on the other side. Take care.